um, couldn't have accounted for or learned in any book beforehand. Sure. Uh, because even if you go back to uh, 1918 with the uh, uh, what, what happened, the pandemic then, uh, you, you know, you could also say that things were different, right? Because society operated in a different way. Um, the way goods were transported, the way people were interconnected, um, a lot of those things were different um, for better or worse, right? So um, if there was some kind of education that, would place you in a way, and this all ties back to, let's say, the creation of those uh, movies we discussed sure. initially. You know, you create a world where you're that CEO, and you see those things happen in real time, and the people along those supply chains and things like that. And it could be that you make those decisions, and then it plays you in a form of a movie, let's say, sure. how those actually play out and show those repercussions happening uh, on a, you know in a more accelerated format so that you could learn more quickly from those decisions. And you could also have a decision tree where you could make two hypotheses, you pick two, and then you see how those play out. Sure. And if you think about like a lot of biz business as far as like advertising and business itself, you know, uh, there's a reason you can look at a, uh, a PNL and, and derive, uh, 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 what has actually happened in the real world based right. on those numbers, right? Um, it could be that you have uh, you've um, had a great year at a restaurant and you made a new hire for a hostess who happens to have a particularly stinky attitude, and that happens to drive down, sure. uh, you know, uh, the amount of people who visit your restaurant. And just by switching that one node out, uh, you you see a completely different change at the bottom line at the end of the year. And that's just a very simple example. But, um, you know, with more complex organizations, you've got tons of nodes and tons sure. of ideas and systems and things that ex extrapolate out. So if you could access what your typical customer thinks and feels and run that through hyper um, uh, sped up, um, you know, uh, algorithms or whatever that could then make those predictions, you could argue that you would have a much more efficient organization. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I think the idea of AI-enabled simulation becomes uh, quite powerful both as a learning tool and, and just being able to provide, uh, as you described, kind of this scenario-driven education that um, would be would be really hard to replicate otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. um, as you mentioned, the example of being the CEO, um, you know, in our second podcast, we talked about asteroid mining, for example, mm -hmm. right? Now, um, uh, obviously, nobody has um, mined asteroids yet. However, we've, um, you know, visited asteroids um, quite a few times now. And it would be interesting to, you know, as whether it's an extension of some sort of, you know, advanced uh, physics based curriculum, again, perhaps even at an early age, and a simulation environment that is forever updating itself in relationship to all known data vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the particulars of asteroids and what mining is generally and applying it in this low gravity like environment, right? Mm -hmm. You could well have, you know, maybe somebody with a, a pointed interest in that, right? Being able to, you know, to show up at the application stage or the job interviews saying, you know, um, yes, I've never been to space, but um, here you can see my my five years of simulated logs, right, mm -hmm. of doing exactly that, running um, all these different um, uh, scenarios, mm -hmm. right, um, that have further reinforced my understanding or the collective understanding of, you know, what is involved in uh, mining an asteroid, right? And I mm -hmm. believe that puts me at... Um, you know, a significant uh, optimized advantage to, um, you know, uh, being involved in this type of work, right? Um, right, right. And, and, and it's kind of interesting, too, backing up and, and thinking of, like, how in a non-AI scenario, right, could, could such knowledge be as easily attained at uh, an individual pupil basis, particularly an individual pupil that is yet younger, mm -hmm. right, in their, um, you know, ability to access certain experiences, right, if you mm -hmm. will. Right. Well, one thing that, um, uh, you know, in, in your example there, it's like you could have somebody who has that five years of experience of running through those uh, let's say, you know, AI advanced kind of simulations, but then they could join an organization that, you know, doesn't really favor that or, uh, 
you know, uh, bring that to its full potential, right? And sure. I think, you know, that's also, um, you know, uh, a reality is that, you know, you can develop out a certain way of thinking. And uh, like, for instance, right, uh, Nikola Tesla works for Edison, I believe, right? And they had disagreements based on, uh, what was it, AC or... Uh, yeah, the uh, ACDC disagreements. DC. Right, yeah. exactly. So, and that eventually made them competitors, right? Um, and, you know, the rest is history there. But, um, the, you know, there's, I guess, a lot of different ways to, um, you know, y- y- uh, learn certain things, but then the implementation of it and then the realities of uh, companies that have established footholds um, and the limitations that they could then self-impose on their development without even knowing. So, you know, if you wanted to, let's say, start, uh, what's a, like a very moat heavy company, let's say you wanted to start a rocket company, right? You're so many years behind, uh, you know, let's say, uh, where SpaceX is today, right? And there's so many different channels you may have to go over, but also there's some benefits to that. The fact that SpaceX exists may make it easier for you because they've already run that four minute mile to then bring on additional capital to then create something that may be slightly different or uh, a different focus than maybe what SpaceX is is working on. So um, I think there's, um, you know, there's organizations that are themselves like organisms that have their own ideas and thoughts and processes. Um, And the hope is if if you're able to bring uh, that new expertise or education, you'd hope that the place you're spending your time, which is limited, um, in is going to be one that fosters that same kind of ethos, uh, towards whatever problem you're going after. Sure. I I was wondering, coming back to the, the book, uh, um, with, which again, we're, we're talking about life 3.0 by Max Tegmark, right? And one of the things uh, b- between um, the, the the book itself and some of his other discussions on other podcasts that I, I think surfaces again and again, and uh, going back through the book a second time, I think maybe even made a profound impact or more profound impact on me, is his questions toward thinking about artificial intelligence and thinking about philosophies of beauty and also thinking about what he describes as a zombie scenario in particular, in which um, one of the things he does in this book is really look at life more generally, right, um, in, in, in the context of the, the larger universe. And in fact, uh, Max has another book called The, the, um, the Mathematical Universe. Uh, so he does spend quite a big um, amount of time doing this analysis on a global universal frame. But coming back to this question of artificial intelligence, of beauty and artificial intelligence and uh, quote unquote zombieism, he um, spends a lot of time being quite concerned about what is um, a little bit of uh, what he calls his worst scenario, and that is the zombie situation, which is effectively a super intelligent zombie AI that breaks out and both eliminates humanity, right, and goes on to colonize not only our solar system, but the, the, the whole entire universe, right? Mm-hmm. And here the way you define zombie, right, is largely that of an AI that has, right, all those dimensions of what we would, um, you know, consider an intelligence, certainly, right? But it doesn't have what is consciousness. And here you would define consciousness is that ability to, um, you know, appreciate beauty, beauty in life, beauty in the universe. So thereby, you know, not only is a, a, a travesty that us as humans, right, um, you know, die at the hands of, you, you know, said AI, but, but this AI kind of moves through the entire, um, you know, cosmos in, in more or less a, a, a non-self-aware, non-appreciative simply, uh, um, you know, matter-based consumption and reproduction mechanism, right, that um, 
you know, you know that it, to another viewer, yes, is technological, but not necessarily uh, conscious, not mm -hmm. philosophically coming back to the, the hierarchy of needs, not necessarily attaining some sort of um, uh, transcendental self-awareness of, you, you know, lo look how glorious life is, right? Um, while, in fact, operating its program quite efficiently, right? Yeah, and I guess, you know, if you think about a lot of those things, which, like, um, from an emotional level and, you know, you could even go down to the chemical level of, um, you know, I guess if you removed, if an AI didn't have the emotions to understand good, bad, gratitude, um, or ego or whatever it might be, um, it, you know, it may not want to do anything else except for what it's meant to do, right? It's, it's, it's typically the, uh, the emotions and the egos and um, that that corrupt things, right? Um, you know, I think we've talked before about like the three G's, right? Uh, uh, God, glory, and gold. And being what historians have called, you know, uh, the three main kind of buckets for why uh, wars and things like that, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or any type of issues kind of uh, potentially arise from. Uh, and you could argue that as much as you want. But if we use that as a base, um, if if an AI doesn't care about God, because that's just not on its spectrum, um, glory, it, if it has no ego, then it may not care about where it is in its position in the world um, or how it's seen, right? Um, and then gold, you know, it it's not like it can get paid and then use that to do something else, right? Um, so what would then drive it to then either you know, go on and do what it's doing. Like, what does it care if it uh, lives in one computer or in the minds of a neural link inside every person? Um, and I think that's where the question is, what is the incentive? Does it gain more? You know, d does the conquest of land mean the same to uh, a, a computer that doesn't exist in the physical world that it does to humans who do? So I think the beauty of, of humans is you have this kind of logical way of potentially looking at the world, uh, and then you've got these emotions that that kind of, uh, for better or worse, taint and affect your filter uh, that then drive you to do certain things, right? Um, d does a uh, AI uh, have the same sexual feelings as a human? Or do they look at another computer and say, wow, I'd really love to court that into some kind of forever relationship? Probably not, because uh, this the environment in which it exists is different. So um, I think if you take that super AI and then uh, place it into the world and then also add in, uh, which I would see as a negative, emotions, uh, I think uh, true emotions, not uh, kind of uh, baked in programmed emotions. Sure. Um, I think you get a totally different person, just like you would have, uh, sorry, a different AI, just like you would have a different person. If let's say you, there was um, a scale of all the different emotions and somebody were to crank up anger, your way of interacting with the world would be completely different for someone who um, ego, you would turn all the way down or anger all the way down. And those, and the way you would interact with your environment would be completely different. So the question is, um, let's say this AI is able to run away and do as it pleases, would it even decide to turn on some form of uh, maybe irrational emotion uh, that would take it away from whatever its, its goal is? Right? Sure. And But let's look at that. I, I think you really, um, yeah, touch upon something um, interesting. And I, I think Max talks about it too in a different way where we, we, we always need to be careful of looking at when we ask the question of what motivates an AI, we, we need to be careful that we don't uh, uh, ascribe to it, as you say, um, you know, kind of a, a, a anthropomorphize it. Right. Um, however, I, he does introduce an interesting idea where I, I think it's more toward if the I, AI, right, is um, basically programmed in, in, in a manner that it is self-improving, right, a, as a mechanism, right? And self-improving in this case can mean um, further optimizing, mm -hmm. right? Meaning that, um, you know, optimization could be you, you know, running a certain subroutines using less power or more efficiently, mm -hmm. right? Okay. 
or um, uh, conversely, um, optimization, right, can, can also mean, um, you know, better using, um, in increasing, uh, in, in, in increasing resources available to it, right? So mm -hmm. when, in, um, you know, one question that he kind of explores is, I, I, I think you're right when you talk about the, the gold scenario, where, um, you know, humans have always been interested in land, right? Um, an AI might be interested in land, but for a very different reason. And, and that might be that, um, you know, land can mean an additional data center or server farm, right? Which can give, you know, a, a additional racks of, you know, storage potential and or computational potential, right? Um, which may, um, you know, solve a goal, which is to how to more efficiently operate and, um, you know, expand the efficiencies of said operations, right? Mm -hmm. Even e even if this goal is not in any way, shape, or form kind of human, right? It's just, um, you know, wh why not bring, you know, more processors online or more hard drives online or more, um, you know, energy output online to feed all the above, even as you're pushing toward efficiencies, right? Yeah, and... So yeah, yeah. By, by the way, and, yeah. and you know what we uh, that, yeah. what we just went through before um, about kind of more yeah. zombie AI, uh, and, and calling out the different emotions that would drive it to to be dangerous. Um, I think that's assuming it runs off by itself, right? Mm -hmm. But um, what's probably closer to the truth is that there is there's going to be organizations or governments or whatever it is um, that will end up being the ones who are actually at the helm of that. And I think what AI becomes is a tool that is then a reflection of the people running it or the organization running it and the way that they want to drive um, yeah. uh, those things. So the AI itself may not care about God, glory, or gold, but the those who are running and operating those data centers, those countries, sure. those whatever it might be, I think that that's where it gets bad. So, um, But then let's say you were to program an AI that worked without humans, um, let's say, and just kind of was able to then govern law because it understood the laws of a people and things of that nature. And then the humans could also make decisions as far as uh, how to tweak the underlying algorithm um, or the AI itself in a more democratic form. Um, you know, that can also get sticky if there's any human uh, interaction baked into it because – uh, you know, then you could just manipulate people to think a certain way or see examples of certain things. And I think we talked about this on one of our first podcasts, but, you know, what is the amount of information or something that you need to see in order to believe it to be true? And, you know, we can tell you that um, rockets have been launched from Cape Canaveral or uh, the Kennedy Center uh, into space. And the reason you believe that is because You've seen it in video form on a news feed or on TV or something like that. Um, but in the future with the power of, uh, you know, the technology to create these things, um, you know, you could say that um, you could say that another side of the country is being invaded and all you need is a few images and videos that you see all over, uh, you know, uh, the live feeds or maybe a call from a relative, which could be faked or whatever to then convince you that that is uh, truly what is happening, right? So without actually being there, and even by being there, your perspective uh, of, of how something happened, your vantage point, uh, could, could also not reflect the reality, right? There's been some launches that have taken place, and uh, because of the certain um, exhaust fumes and clouds or uh, whatever the uh, they call it, um, created in the sky. Some people would report aliens or UFOs, but really it was a rocket launch that just wasn't uh, known to the people, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think, you know, that that type of man, um, manipulation uh, would be way easier if you had an AI system that could generate things that are so lifelike and so real. Uh, you know, so where does this all go? I mean, I hate to keep referencing the book, but that's what the simulation arcade is about. Mm -hmm. um, it's essentially that um, eventually uh, with technology uh, in every form factor removes all limitations from life. So um, the ability to get sick, um, all of that, you know, could potentially be solved um, and you could live forever b by uh, manipulating your genes to never age um, and your cells to never age. Um, you could solve 
all of the hardships that humans could potentially experience. And the only thing left to do is an, entertain yourself. But how long can you sit there and look at a feed? Um, so, or whatever the entertainment is. So the thought of the book is uh, you would join this thing called the simulation arcade, which is essentially um, a, a game that is, you know, your first player, just like you live life today. Uh, but you wipe your memory when you join it. And, you know, every time you finish whatever that game is, which could be the death of the character or whatever is in that game, um, you could essentially, um, you know, pick another life to live. So, you know, why limit yourself to the life you're currently living? Why not go back and be somebody who you deem great? Like if you wanted to be um, whatever, uh, Neil Armstrong and be the first person to walk on the moon, mm -hmm. you know, do you, do you experience that by just living the time before you launch to the time that you're back? Or do you start that as an infant being born in that society and really experiencing all those things? Because if you have unlimited time because the body in which you're encapsulated and can last forever, then what are you going to do with infinity? Uh, so uh, to some degree, all of the problems could be figured out. And your only solution is to, uh, you know, spend that time doing something that's uh, exciting and worthwhile, which could be living the lives of other people. Uh, it could also, you could also manipulate, let's say you had worlds that you could create. What if you created, lived the same life you initially lived, uh, but maybe 200 years back, um, and maybe instead of gravity being one strength, it's a little lighter or a little stronger, and the world looks a little bit different because the physics are different uh, because of the gravity that pulls down on the world mm. around you. Um, or maybe instead of breathing air to survive as a human um, or us being closer related to, uh, you know, uh, monkeys, you're closer related to dolphins or whales. And you live entire worlds and galaxies based off of that. And you go in with a wiped mind so that it's new, unique, and uh, uh, more authentic. Because if you went in knowing, hey, if I just jump in front of this car, uh, I'll eventually just wake up back in my pod, back in wherever, hmm. and uh, be able to jump back in. And that's no fun. So creating those limitations in that simulation arcade, I think uh, makes it a little more fun. Sure. Yeah. No, that's, uh, um, that's interesting, right? It, it, it's also interesting. Uh, I, I'm reminded in a different way. Uh, there is, and, and by the way, as I pass this week to you, maybe we should just stop for a second. And um, again, this is a uh, gradient proof. And uh, today, our, our drink of choice is uh, Monkey Shoulder uh, Batch 27, um, which is uh, bottled in Scotland from the, the same company behind Glenn Fittich and also Hendrix Gin, right? And uh, Monkey Shoulder, the name is taken from a repetitive strain injury that distillery workers would develop after years of shoveling barley on the malting floor, right? So um, it was launched in 2005, right? And it has a sweet, spicy style um, of, of, uh, uh, of uh, whiskey, right? So um, that's kind of what we're drinking. And as always, we encourage you to, you know, uh, uh, you, you know go out and uh, buy and uh, <laughs> drink along no, with no. us. <laughs> drink along please. with us. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. Right. But until uh, they sponsor us. Then. Until they sponsor yeah, us, yeah. indeed. So, um, no, wonderful. And, uh, you know, going back to what I was thinking of earlier when you were talking about, you know, who guides the AI, it, it also kind of, uh, you know, highlights a, another example where an AI that um, is. Uh, potentially programmably deterministic on what its goals are, right? Or at least influenced to certain goals. Um, there is a, a website introduced to a, a good friend of mine uh, many years ago, and it's called Orion's Arm. And this was originally started by a group, I, I believe it's uh, both Stanford and MIT. And what they um, have posited to do over the years and have done a really good job is almost kind of create a Wikipedia type format of a harder science fiction, right? Uh, that that looks at a, a lot of different exploratory concepts, including timelines and technologies. And AI is a big part of 
of of what they they kind of concern themselves with. And and the one scenario that kind of emerges and is kind of like delightfully ambiguous because two different possibilities are offered is in this scenario, humans have successfully uh, left planet Earth and colonized the solar system and gone on to, to, to colonize, you know, larger parts of the galaxy as well. But what's happened on Earth is um, an AI system that was initially created to mitigate uh, the effects of a changing climate, right, um, has, for whatever reason, further optimized to this ideal such that they, they effectively kicked all the humans off planet, right, and restored the planet to a much earlier ecological moment, right, which is not to say that there aren't some limited number of homo sapiens on the planet, but they kind of exist in the way that homo sapiens might have existed maybe 1.5 million years ago or a million years ago on our own planet, right? Which is a, a separate discussion that could be interesting, right? But but where this goes is why this AI made this decision, right, is a little bit ambiguous in the fact that was this in fact right, um, just simply a, a manifestation of the goal, that is to, you know, to restore and protect the environment, right, okay? And the humans were seen as uh, a limitation of that goal, so it basically de-technologicalized the whole planet, right, and kick, you, you know, kicked excess humans off planet, right? And if such humans attempt to recolonize the planet, they will be met by lethal force, so you better not, right, okay? Or, right, was this goal perhaps, um, you know, programmed into the AI, right, by, you know, one of many, um, you know, environmental ecological groups, right, that was a little bit hard, more hardline in, in what they felt the, 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 the final outcome should be, right, of, of the environmental reality on Earth, right? And, and uh, you know, to me, this is kind of fascinating, particularly when you, we think of AIs with, um, you know, real uh, technological and computational type like abilities to change the world around it. But um, they, they simply may or may not be conscious, right, of, you know, who or what they are and, um, you know, be able to self-govern <laughs> limitations on um, you know, what certain outcomes may look like. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I think what's interesting about that, this idea of um, kind of removing all of these uh, effective uh, societies that potentially um, manipulate or affect the environment. You know, we talked about this a little bit on the last podcast um, about um, some form of technology that could actually control uh you know, the weather and the kind of uh, uh, ecosystem uh, of the earth, right? So, um, you know, there's there's been talk about, um, l let's say, for instance, the, uh, the, the current thing that people are trying to avoid is uh, to not heat up the planet so much, right? But I think one of the points we got to on the last podcast was, um, what if it was an inverse, right? What if we were uh, on the front of a an ice age that would also uh, greatly affect, you know, the uh, in, entire Earth and potentially kill billions of people uh, based on the conditions that that would bring? So you'd be looking at a inverse kind of response, which is how do you introduce more carbon or how do you find some other way of heating up uh, the Earth in order to make it more inhabitable, right? Um, so I, I think... There's a few different ways, and I think one that we're kind of going for on a societal level is how do we reduce our output and things of that nature? I think that's always good. You want to look at um, you know efficiencies and how to do things more efficiently because there's no reason to put particulates in the air if there is truly a uh, better system uh, that could be more efficient, right? But uh, I, I think the, the bigger question that I'm not sure many are asking is – how do we actually um, modify and affect the environment to then make the weather what you want it? So if 
uh, and, and by the way, this could also potentially be used as a weapon. Um, you know, imagine there's some other country and you uh, hit them with uh, a drought for a certain numbers of years. Um, that could affect the way that they feed their people, right? So, uh, and, and that's kind of uh, a, a different type of warfare. But uh, let's say avoiding that uh, rabbit hole. If it's more so, uh, how do we regulate the uh, environment that you could do as you please and still not affect uh, those those greater environments and uh, the way things work, right? So I think that's um, something that if you would hope that would be developed before the solution of removing every person from uh, the environment is is uh, is the chosen solution. Um, and I think I think that that becomes uh, increasingly interesting. Um, you know, why does it need to rain? in a place like New York, where the only thing it's watering is the concrete on the ground uh, and the people there, where you could sufficiently just water it through irrigation. Uh, and why doesn't it rain more or the perfect amount um, in maybe a field not so far away? Uh, and, you know, to kind of limit and work from a more efficient standpoint, instead of growing bananas in South America and bring them over, why not create um, a, a portion or even a plot of land that got the exact amount of uh, irrigation or environmental conditions to grow bananas uh, right outside the place they're consumed. Um, so I think, you know, we'll probably get to a point where, uh, you know, that's figured out. And you could say uh, it seems far-fetched and maybe it's not possible, but, uh, you know, there's it's probably just an issue of, of uh, you know, physics and uh, – I don't know enough about it, but you could see that something like that could be developed out. And I think what we'll probably see in the future as far as a consumption level, um, right now it's more efficient to move parts uh, across the globe, um, let's say to manufacture something, because maybe one uh, country or, or uh, environmental condition makes it uh, more reasonable to uh, ship it across the world on a container to then be assembled in a factory to then be brought over to another plant to introduce a chip or something like that, depending on when, where those components are made. But um, maybe in the future, uh, it'll all be local. So instead of you having to ship things across the world, which have their own issues as far as, you know, potentially wasting time and, uh, you know, human capital uh, focusing on, on that trade, you could make it that wherever you are, you can access all the things you need. There's a, you know, there's a company that's creating this machine that essentially will produce any type of drink be, uh, or flavor profile based on, I think it's like 11 different key ingredients that could all be introduced at different varying amounts and processes. Um, so like, you know, why run to the store uh, and pick up a Coke when you can make that uh, by clicking a couple buttons. So I think, again, it's a, an efficiency thing. You know, um, you know, why waste your time, uh, you know, moving bananas across the ocean when you can grow them outside your doorstep? Um, so, yeah, yeah. What, what about another question that I, I, I think it, whenever we talk about AI, right, there's also the, this question about um, artificial general intelligence, right, and uh, what, what AI is kind of today, right? Mm -hmm. So while, uh, you, you know, through OpenAI, we have ChatGPT, we have uh, GPT, right? Uh, through, through Google, I, I think we have the Lambda models, right? You know, uh, Facebook has done a number of different things as well. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the ocean, uh, Baidu is doing different things and such like that. Mm -hmm. But um, nobody would look at these and, and call them um, artificial general intelligence, which is kind of the the holy grail of you. You know, um, you know, we 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 might think of in Star Trek terms, uh, Lieutenant Commander Data, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That is being, um, you know. A holistic AI system that is capable of uh, self-evolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, being able to uh, learn and, and, and develop, uh, not not simply at the level of, uh, um, you know, a acquiring new skills and improving upon that, but also having that type of, you know, uh, conscious self-awareness, right? Coming back to that question of, you know, um, not uh, existing as the the quote unquote 
uh, a zombie, but but uh, capable of recognizing, um, you know, a beauty in the world, right? Even as maybe some of that can still be debated, right? Mm-hmm. But but there there is that sensibility that this is um, um, a, a whole or wholer system, right? Mm-hmm. Um, wh- when do you think we, we we kind of achieve, or or do you think we 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 achieve? this type of moment within our lifetime or um, at all? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i not uh, in the trenches there, but, um, you know, it, it's um, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, you can see obviously now uh, every year and just how many people have uh, started using uh, chat GPT-3. I mean, I think it was like, a million people users in one day and then within a several months it, it's a hundred million users which is um so there's obviously some interest and utility uh to this product who knows it may be um uh you know maybe that doesn't sustain itself and it kind of levels out or plateaus but i think in, initially it seems like um what we'll see is you know more kind of segmented um ai databases and ways of looking at the world are going to be uh, advanced and put into place and maybe make slow adaptations. So, um, you know, if you need to synthesize something or if you want to write a book or whatever it might be, um, you could do that fairly quickly. But then I think, um, what will be more interesting is how you take those rudimentary things like reading, writing, image creation, and then tie them into something that, um, is, has some kind of economic, uh, exchange on, right? Um, if everybody can write a book um, about any subject because it can access the databases of the world of current knowledge and put to get th- together something uh, really interesting, um, why would you buy someone else's book? Why wouldn't you just say, uh, I'm more of a technical person, please create this book on mm-hmm. physics, but only use imagery uh, of this style, Right mm-hmm. or whatever it might be. So instead of you actually going and then buying other people's creations, you can so much easier to just make your own. Sure. Um, and then if let's say you like that read in an audio format, you could have it read by an artist or uh, uh, or someone significant that you deem significant in that field. So if I want to learn about space and I have Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, you know, read me whatever I'm asking for in his voice. Uh, walking me through that, right? So that's that's potentially interesting. Or maybe you're more, you want a book, so there's a service that would then create that book and then ship it to you, mm-hmm. um, and it would be built out the way that you like to learn, right? Um, so I, I think that's probably the nearer future, and I mean that could literally be in the next six months. All it would really take is somebody to just connect those different nodes together because you have those pieces now. Um, but I think that changes, like, think about all that it changes, right? The publishing industry, the, um, you know, how does Neil deGrasse Tyson feel if his voice is being used sure. to read to people that he doesn't really give permission to read to? Well, he might complain, but is... But uh, you could also have a monetizable relationship. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. And then what do you do about someone who's no longer here, you know, mm-hmm. and have somebody who's uh, not around and they have no relatives to fight for it uh you know so like uh let's say you had audio recordings of shakespeare and he Mm -hmm. read or taught you how to do poetry i mean by the way we could also say that i heard somebody say on a podcast like there's something about the human way that people uh tell stories and uh talk about ideas and you just can't replicate that and i mean that person obviously doesn't know uh too much of what's to come here Mm -hmm. because you could look at all the best orders and maybe like in a more uh, specific individual level, how somebody likes to be talked to. Mm-hmm. There's some cultures where yelling at each other is a way to have a conversation mm-hmm. um, and others where that's seen as uh, extremely aggressive, an extremely aggressive uh, uh, environment, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, and you could have somebody with the voice, let's say, Neil deGrasse Tyson, but you want him to yell at you Mm -hmm. when he teaches you about physics because that's the only way it gets pounded into your head, right? Because that builds some kind of sense of urgency versus someone who wants to be kind of spoken to very softly. So, I mean, everyone's – I I think there's some interesting things there. But uh, I think that's probably the first step. And then um, 
you know, it could advance really quickly. I think if you're creating images and all these things, I, there's going to be, um, I think, a lot of obviously resistance for mm -hmm. the people that are, I, I know I said wiped out before, but, you know, wiped out in the sense of uh, a 30 year time frame. Uh, it could look if you're year one and year 30, that that whole industry is wiped out. But uh, there's going to be, you know, some form of uh, war between those uh, existing constituents uh, incumbents that are essentially going to be changed, right? Is there a reason that uh, some actor you like is the actor you like? Well, it's because you've maybe grown up with them and you've seen them in a couple films and they've baked into your memory as uh, an actor that you like, right? But why does that person have to be a real person? Why can't it be an actor similar? And then also you get around all this drama and bullshit of, um, you know, personal actors who uh, outside of the movie screen or wherever, uh, end up being a person you don't like on a personal level because they have different political views or inputs or whatever. And we've seen that plenty of times where there's a beloved character um, in any type of organization and they just get uh, reamed over because they have certain thoughts of, uh, you know, different thoughts on different political views. So why subject uh, or why deal with that, you know, uh, part of it if you could kind of get rid of it or create characters that aren't subject to those types of things. Nobody is getting mad at Mario because of his, his, his uh, liberal or conservative views because Mario is just a character. Um, so why does a character have to look like a small Italian uh, cartoon and why can't it be somebody who looks like somebody you want it to be? And maybe your character is different. Maybe your Barbie is one skill, skin color and someone else is another. And we're already seeing that where it's there's uh, an attempt for companies to create more kind of inclusive things. But, you know, um, skin color or political views are only kind of the more, more surface level differences that people have. Um, maybe you're a night owl and your favorite character when you watch a movie is a night owl. He's not up at 5 a.m. Uh, running through uh, the fog on top of a mountain. Uh, because that's something you can't relate to because that doesn't happen in your life, but maybe it does in somebody else's. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, who, who knows? I mean, um, sure. Yeah. And another thing I wonder, because you kind of mentioned the point about uh, the disruption coming to, to various interests, industries in terms of book production, um, et cetera, right? Um, you know, ironically enough, that kind of reminds me of uh, Stevenson um, when when he wrote uh, The Diamond Age um, or A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. He kind of highlighted the fact that what had happened was that much, most of society, kind of as we were talking about before, existed in a hyper-customized uh, environment of whether it be news, whether it be game, whether it be the other form of entertainment. Right. Mm -hmm. But then you also had another part of society that was, um, I believe, called uh, or were kind of neo Victorian in the sense that they um, had their paper kind of delivered to them once a day. Mm -hmm. And it was the same paper that other similar people would receive. Mm -hmm. Right. And they read it as such, right? And it, it, it was the complete opposite, meaning that do you, is it possible culturally that in, in the same way that, um, you know, some people will buy, um, you know, handmade items over, um, you know, mass made items, right? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have a future in which uh, some people, uh, you know, will um, vote with their 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 pocketbook, so to speak, and only purchase right human written articles, human written books, human written poetry, human written plays, um, and and that is a conscious choice, but is a choice that is made still by a large enough group of people, right, mm -hmm. uh, with all the people on the planet, yeah. right. That it, um, you, you, you know, there, there's a lot of money to be made there, so to speak, right? Just a thought. Yeah, right? potentially. And I think yeah. that's, that's maybe part of the zero to 30 year resistance, right? Sure. It's, um, hey, I, I want to buy only American made products. And some stores had created sections of American made products. You don't see that anymore because typically the sales uh, are going to go, you know. Wait, there's more. To listen to the next part of this episode, please follow the platform catalog.